I'm John Wilker, the organizer of 360 Edit. I hope you enjoy this session recording, but first I wanted to mention one thing. We've served the community since 2009, and over the past few years we've had to take on debt in an effort to keep the conference alive. After several unforeseen challenges, not the least of which is a pandemic of indefinite duration, we've had to make the hard choice to end the conference as we're now facing over $100,000 in debt. As a result of requests from the community of how they can help, we've created a GoFundMe campaign. If you're inclined and able, please consider donating to help keep 360 iDev going. The QR code after this will link you to the campaign. Thank you. Enjoy the recording. So I can never spell, so I have to, uh, you know, that's how I remember how you spell it. I always want to put an E in there. Anyway, seriously, we're in advanced codable. Yeah. Um, what is an iOS app? It's a program for turning JSON into views. That's what we do all day. That's all we do all day. And the tool we use for that is Codable, and specifically, it's JSON Decoder. I, I expect most of you do know the basics. I, I hope so. I'm going to, going to assume that for this talk. You know, automatic conformances, the basics of writing a manual conformance, container keyed by, that sort of thing, decode for key, basic coding keys kind of stuff. Today, I want to focus on a level below that. I want to keep going a bit deeper on the kind of weird problems that people ask for help on. You should really think about this talk as more how to think about codable. This is not tips and tricks. Um, I'm going to show a lot of code. I'm going to show a lot of code. Uh, but I'll post it all for you at the end and uh, along with the whole text of this talk. The point isn't the code examples. The point is how you can write your own code when you have problems, so that you understand how the codable system works. Swift can auto-conform types for us. Uh, it writes code for us, and that's fine for some very basic projects. Unfortunately, the moment you need anything that is not exactly something Apple imagined you were going to do, it all falls apart. And uh, you have to write everything by hand. Very, very frustrating, um, but if you take just one thing away from this talk, um, it's this. Do not wrap yourself around autoconformance, uh, auto right? Writing conformances by hand is not very hard. It's just tedious, right? So do not, um, do not look for things that take that simple, fast, easy to understand code and turn it into you know, complicated little trickeries. Those things come back and bite us. The most common trick I see people using is that they want to mark every, op every property as optional. Please do not do this. It creates a lot of problems. First, are really, seriously, all of your properties are optional? You can work with nothing? ID is optional? I mean, what, what are you going to do when you, with this? Can you really proceed if you don't know any values? Uh, wouldn't it be better to stop early? down at the decoding layer and, and fix it or stop, right? Rather than have the rest of your program have to deal with this bizarre corrupted record all over the place. And that's the biggest problem. It makes your, uh, the rest of your code a mess of no coalescing and over, question marks and compact maps and all this stuff. It is better to figure out your error handling in one place. Clean it up if you must, throw if you can't handle it, and then have solid data that the rest of your program can just deal with. This is also where you're going to test, right? If all of your various views can have lots of nil coalescing, you have tests for all those, right? So that they work properly with, the co with you know, corrupted data. I'm betting you don't. This is a lot easier code to test than all your view controllers, or I guess views now. Making everything optional actually doesn't even protect you all that much. If an enum has an unexpected value, something you thought wasn't always going to be an int sometimes is a string because you're talking to PHP, uh, the whole parser will still throw. And so you still have to deal with that fact. The only thing optional means is it's okay for it to be missing, which sometimes that is in fact okay, but even in that case, you probably want a default value, and that default value is probably empty. Right? Empty array, empty string, and the like. The only time you really mean nil is in the case where missing is semantically different than empty. 
which does occasionally happen, but it's kind of rare. If you find yourself nil coalescing a lot, or if you ever think you need a nil or empty extension, you're using optionals too much. Stop it. The other trick I see people use uh, is property wrappers. I want to love them. I want to so much. Someday, 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 maybe. When they are actually like true type annotations, generalized type annotations, I think that they will work. Today, every set of property wrappers I have evaluated has tons of little corner cases. They start off awesome when you're just building little tiny things and you don't have to, it's all, oh, yay, I just scatter some stuff, it's great. As your system becomes complicated and you need error handling, they start to fall apart. Um, some of them, some of the most beautiful ones to use, if you implement them wrong at all, if you make your initializer wrong at all, oh, they crash at runtime. That's a non-starter, right? I don't think property wrappers are today the answer. That said, if they are working for you, and I know lots of people that they work great for, great. I mean, that's totally fine. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about them today. The other little thing, I haven't seen a lot of people try to use this. I just, you're going to see it if you look through the docs, and you're going to go, wait, there's a way to configure Codable? Yeah. Um, it was added in iOS 15. As best I can tell, it only is used for attributed string, and I've had trouble getting it really to be useful for anything other than attributed string. Maybe it's useful. I'm not going to talk about it because I couldn't make it useful. If you have a lot of very, very large objects and you just don't want to, you don't want to type all the code, right? There are a couple of tools I recommend. And the first stop for basic codable problems, if you have any codable, like just, I just need a basic implementation, quick type, app.quicktype.io. This is brilliant. Um, you paste arbitrary JSON over on the left. It gives you code in Swift or 20 other languages on the right. I love it. The only problem, I mean, the only thing is it has lots and lots of options, but I mean, it's not a full solution for all kinds of error handling and everything else. It has certain ways it writes the code. But if you have kind of a well-behaved format, this is really nice, for, especially for getting you started, getting like a basic uh, implementation. If, however, you need to go further, you need, you have lots and lots and lots of, of properties, you don't want to write all that code, you have complicated needs, the answer is let code write code. The answer is CodeGen, right? Pull out Sorcery, pull it out. It has a whole bunch of templates already. You can build all your own things you need if that is really your problem. But the thing is, I think a lot of times it's not that complicated. People just don't want to write a few lines of code. Just write the code. OK. Do not bend your model around autoconformance. OK, that's enough setup. Let's actually get into it. Um, let's talk about coding key. Coding key is a protocol. It is not a magic enum thingy. Um, coding keys don't have to be enums. It's a protocol. There does happen to be some compiler special magic. If they are enums, there are little things that get done for you automatically. But it's just a protocol. This is the protocol. It wraps a string value. It also, on the side, might wrap an int value, which rarely actually matters. The main thing is it wraps a string value. That's it. You can actually see what the compiler does. Uh, if you want to see its automatic conformance, all that code that it writes for you, it will tell you. You can hand it to the compiler, pass uh, whatever, print AST, the abstract syntax tree, and it will dump it out in beautiful Swift code and show you exactly what the compiler is going to see. This is very, very nice, and will show you just how much code it is, right? Small things can be hundreds of lines of, con of uh, conformance code written for you which you then also ship, <laughs> so keep that in mind. So what does it do for this, for this very, very basic type? Uh, it generates an enum, um, and uh, it creates this equatable, it's very interesting to me, it creates like an equatable uh, conformance for it that's based on numbers. You might immediately go, oh, it's gonna be based on strings, but it would be slow to compare strings. So they actually write tons and tons of code to do uh, integer check it. I'm not at all saying that this code is like slow or bloated. The, I'm sure the optimizer can eat this up but, um, and, and, and make it very small. But it is interesting to see what it writes. The important part, though, the guts of it, is it writes this kind of little conformance for your enum. And that's all, all it does. It ignores integer values, and it wraps a string. Cool. 
What if we made a struct that just did that? Glad you asked. I love this type. This is my favorite type. Um, I, this is a custom type. I mean, this is just mine. Everybody makes, tons and tons of people have invented this type many, many, many times. They call it lots of things. Um, but it's just a wrapper around a string. Um, this is the most minimal form you can have. This isn't actually the one I use personally. The one I use personally also does handle integer types, and I'll post it. Most importantly, it handle, it is, conforms to expressible by string literal. So you can just use quoted strings, and they will be a coding key. This is good. Oftentimes, I'm like, don't just make strings be things. But for here, and you'll see throughout this talk, it's actually really nice. Since it's just a wrapper around a string, and JSON keys are always strings, it means it can handle any JSON you want. By the way, you'll notice I'm always talking about JSON. I never talk about binary property lists or other kinds of property lists. And that's because, unless you work at Apple, we all use JSON, and we never use property lists. Although, I will say, if you're sta saving stuff locally, binary property lists kind of rock. They're actually smaller than JSON. But um, why do I love this struct so much? Well, for one, it gets rid of the need. You don't even need coding keys, right? You can just use strings. Now, you're seeing hard-coded string literals down there. And that may make people kind of freak out. Go, oh, no. How could you hard-code strings? Here's the thing. If you only encode decodable or only encode only conform to decodable or only conform to encodable, that string exists exactly one place in your entire program. That's good. That is better. That is objectively better than it being a constant somewhere else in the program. Because that creates two things, right? This is, this is good. And I'm telling you, I recommend only implement the part of codable you need. Do not do both encodable and decodable if you don't need both. It is two things. One is it's a lot of overhead because it writes a lot of extra code. But the bigger reason is it's not what you meant. And it creates headaches. When all of a sudden you have somewhere deep in a big tree that you have promised is encodable, you have this one type that's hard to encode. But you didn't need to encode it. And then you write fatal error as the encode. And now you have the worst of all possible worlds. <laughs> right? You say it's encodable. Oh, but it'll crash. Ah. I admit, this is a bit of code for every conformance. That's, I don't like that. We, we want it to be tighter. The first thing I tend to do is I use any uh, key decoder or any key container a lot, so a little extension is nice. And, you know, I don't like using return types as the way you conform, how, how you decide a generic type usually. In this case, because it's just an option, because you can use the normal one that passes the type, this is just another option that doesn't pass the type. And so you can have either way. You can have it work either way. So I like this a lot. And it gets rid of a lot of noise in your implementation. Well, as long as we're getting rid of noise, why don't we use subscripts? We can get rid of a lot of noise, right? That's kind of nice. And now this is getting really compact and very, very focused on exactly what you need. But why stop there? How about default values, right? Now there's no need for an optional anymore. Cool. Um, you'll notice, I want you to be very careful. You'll notice it's try, not try question mark. It's try decode if present, which returns an optional, and that gets null coalesced. This only says use a default if it's missing, not if it's corrupted. And you know, missing is empty is really, really so having to say default open bracket close bracket might be kind of why we do that all the time. We could say or empty, right? This, I said before, don't create nil or empty. Yeah, don't do that like all over your program. But this is the one place you should do it right when the data comes in. That's good. What about errors, right? We would like to re recover gracefully when we don't expect something from the server. Okay. Um, but the thing is, if we get really aggressive about them and just throw away all of our errors, debugging is really hard, really hard. So here's an option, fail with subscript. This asserts in debug, so if you suddenly, if you didn't really understand the contract with the server, you know, you'll find out. But okay, in release, we'll, we'll go ahead and dump in unknown for the name. Now, you'll notice how I've done this, age still has to be there, has to be right. 
or it'll throw. Maybe it's more important. The point is you can mix and match. You can decide what makes sense. What about the children property where there's a bunch of, there's a whole collection you're pulling up? And maybe I say, if some of the children aren't there or have a problem, there's something I can't decode, just keep going. Like, take the ones I can figure out. And we can do that. And again, I can add a system that says, but if that happens, a certain debug, so I know. It's up to you. You could even add, you know, logging here if you wanted to in, in release so that you could find out if it's happening in the field. With all of those together, decoding logic starts to look like this. And I think that this is really, really quite compact, right? You're not typing a lot of things that you don't absolutely need. And in fact, when you're working with property wrappers, you probably are going to type more than this. And you could add more extensions, right? Whatever date formatters, like if you want to de decode your dates a particular way, you want to decode with base64 or hex, you can add those as special subscripts with where clauses. It's just extensions. And there's no need to, de to assign all the stuff in the decoder. The fact that JSON decoder has all these strategies is madness, right? That's not where you want to, that's not where you want to configure things. You want to configure them in the type. You can do that here. Again, this is not, I'm not trying to say use these extensions. I'm not just, this is not a library. This is a pattern. What makes sense depends on the data you are working with. Even for a single API, different responses may need different error handling. Say you have a corrupt record in a list of product recommendations, right? And there's 20 product recommendations and 19 of them are good and one of them you don't understand how to decode because they changed an enum on you. Throw, the, throw that one away, who cares, right? Compact map it out, ah, who cares? But on the other hand, if you're syncing down, say this is a syncing engine and you have the user's contacts and you know, you're trying to keep it synchronized with some server, you don't want to, because you didn't understand one of the records, delete that locally. In fact, you don't want probably to accept the, anything like, if I didn't understand it perfectly, I should probably just stop because I'm going to corrupt my user's data. You have to think about this stuff, and you need to test that stuff. Yes, I mean, this forces you to think about every property. I know, I know. I'm saying you need to think about every property. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> and decide what to do. And if the problem is it's just too much code to write, that's where things like code gens come in play. That's where, when you use like sorcery to write it for you, but it can't think for you. You will have to think about your data. Any coding key is really nice. I use that a lot, but another really powerful tool uh, for handling like arbitrary keys is just a string key dictionary, right? String to something, dictionary. Say you have this JSON, the keys are not fixed. This is probably the most common codable question on Stack Overflow. I have, you know, the keys could be anything. Um, now, say you don't care about the identifiers. You know, they're not actually part of the person. You know, they just, that's just how the server happens to send it. Don't overthink it. That's just a string to person dictionary, decode that, take the values, you're done. Okay, okay but that's too simple. Let, let's, let's do the thing that really comes up, which is that identifier is in fact part of the person record, right? We need it. Now, of course, you could make a partial person and you know, decode this as a string to partial person and then, bleh, yuck, don't do that. Let's do it better. The decoder's coding path keeps track of the keys that got you here, right? A decoder lives at a level. That level is defined as the coding path. And the last one is the one we just opened up, which is a key. And remember, coding keys are just wrappers around strings. So you can decode a string to person dictionary. Inside the person, you can say, hey, let me look at, let me just take where I am, and that's my ID, very easy. And then at the end, I'm just gonna throw away the keys, because I didn't need, you didn't actually need them. Now, sometimes a simple dictionary doesn't quite work. That's not, you know, for example, sometimes the values actually have different types in the JSON, um, and so that wouldn't work. You couldn't. What you only want is that little results part. And so you might think, well, I could do a string to string to person array, but it's not a string to string to person array because status doesn't, is different. And it, the other things get in the way. You can't, so you can't do it. 
how do you do this? Okay, we're gonna create a wrapper type, person response, to handle it. And then we're just gonna drill down into it to pull out all the pieces. If you've ever you know, built like all these layers of wrapper structs just to get down to the one piece you wanted, this is a much, much easier way that doesn't require elaborate um, uh, extra code. Also, this is much easier to actually understand what's going on. Now, since the final output is um, an array of person, right? Everybody wants to write this extension where they go, oh, well, if it's an array of person, then, use, then I'm gonna use a different decoder. <sighs> Unfortunately, you'll get this warning, and this warning is not kidding around. It is going to be ignored. It will compile, but it will just throw away your extension because you can't do this. You cannot, a given type can only conform to a protocol exactly one way. You can't keep add, you can't add additional where clauses to say, well, it, but if it's X, then conform this other way. An array already conforms to codable, you're done. You can't add any new ones. So you do need a wrapper type. I'm sorry. Another really common question I run into is dealing with JSON that's not the same structure as your, as your JSON, right? Or as your data. Like in this case, it just has a bunch of random thing, a bunch of random attributes that are in there. And also I have these two things, type and name, that are in fact static. This is really common in server protocols. So how do I handle that? Encoding is super straightforward, but I think is really worth seeing. You know, just encode normally, you know, encode all your stuff. And then you can tell the dictionary to encode itself at this level. And that will just, it'll merge right in. So that's, that's very easy. Decoding is a little bit trickier. Um, it's a little bit more work, but it's not very hard. Um, make, a make a container for your coding, for your explicit keys, right, for type and name, and then decode them. You'll notice I'm using these subscript things. It doesn't, that's not just for any coding key. That works for any key, you know, those extensions work for any key you like. You can make your syntax look any way you like. Um, once you've done that, now make an any keyed container over it and decode any keys that aren't in your coding keys, right? So decode everything else. Now, containers are just views over decoder storage. You are free to make as many as you like. You are free to make them with different coding keys if, as you like. All fine, totally supported, explicitly supported. So not a problem. Also, notice here how I'm pulling up a string, that I'm creating string values or I'm trying to, to see if this is a legitimate coding key, um, and uh, I can pull the string values out. That's because coding keys are allowed to do that. You don't need to make your enums, you don't have to make your coding keys uh, raw representable, and you don't need to make them uh, with string storage. That's in fact wasteful. There's no reason to do that, and it's just wasteful. Um, I mean, if you need it for some other reason, fine, but. Here, it works fine. That's what coding keys do. Um, for the next example I'm going to get to, I first am going to want a map function. So let's make that on ex uh, unkeyed containers, which are for arrays. I would sure like to map them. Now, why can't they map and why aren't they sequences? Well, the reason is every key, every object in an unkeyed container can be of a different type. Right, I mean, they're essentially arrays of, co of decodables. Um, so we don't want, so they can't conform to sequence. But we can make a map that makes sense. And the way we do it is we have our transform function accept a decoder and then return, just return a consistent type. Decoders um, handle a specific uh, level, right, that con a consistent coding path. So when you're descending, you need to get a nested decoder, right? In the same way, if you've seen there are nested containers, you can ask, you can create a container, you can take your container and make a nested container, you can make a nested decoder, except they're not called nested decoders, they're called super decoders, which is a very strange name. Why in the world are they called super decoders? History. Um, a little sidebar, how do you encode classes with inheritance? 
turns out it's actually a little tricky. Um, let's say we have some class, we're gonna call it super, and uh, it in, it'll auto-generate for us a conformance to encodable. Uh, I'll put it's JSON, no problems. Awesome, make a subclass. Subclass already, that subclass already has an encode to method because it inherited it. Swift is not going to make it another one because it already has one. So it will only encode its superclass's properties and not its own. <sighs> okay, so you have to write your own encodable, encoder. And unfortunately, it's not listed as a required, it doesn't come up as required, so you, don't, you won't even get a warning that you failed to implement it. It just won't work right. <sighs> so what do you do? Okay, I go ahead and I, I encode my own properties, and then what? Well, the obvious answer is, in fact, usually the right answer, which is just call super. Cool. And this will merge your properties together, which is probably what you wanted. But, you know, that's actually a little unsafe. That assumes you know how your superclass encodes itself. You might have conflicting keys. You might even have a different kind of container. Your superclass might be in an unkeyed container, and you may need a keyed container, and then it will throw. You can't, you can't mix container types at the same level. So another way to do it is to have a key called super, that's the default name, um, and encode your super class's properties into it. And this is kind of how I think the Swift team originally imagined we would do, I've never seen anybody use this, but this is kind, and this is why they called it super, it's nested. Okay, what if you wanna maintain some state? Here's, we're gonna use that little map. Um, you wanna maintain some state while you're decoding. Uh, for example, it may be useful for each category in the tree to know its full path, right? So laptop would know that it was in electronics computer, right? And also, um, I wanna, just to make things interesting, I also wanna know the total count. And I don't wanna walk this tree twice. I wanna know this while I'm decoding, right? Because we wanna be fancy. How do you do that? We need some state. Now, we can't use coding path because the coding path here is item one. Item one is the automatic thing you would get when it's an unkeyed container. It will still have a string key. The string key is literally the word item space one or in index. Um, and one because it's the second one, right? Because we're computer people and we don't know how to count. Uh, the next one will be after item one, it will be children, children because that's actually how you got here. That's not very useful. We didn't want that. So can't use coding key. And we know that, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna build, we're gonna have the root container up the top. We have, we have to have that because it needs to keep that total count. So that's why it's a separate type. And it will map over its container and create categories from it, right? And it needs to pass, it's gonna pass an in-out total count. Let me pull this up. For each element, decode the category. This is not the decodable um, initializer, right? It's taking extra parameters. In fact, category is not decodable. It does not conform to decodable. There is no rule that says that things must conform to decodable to be decoded. They just must accept a decoder and do the decoder thing, right? You're free to do whatever you want. Decoders are not magical. They are just things. You can pass them around. Um, total count is an in-out so that we can pass things back up. So here is categories. Um, the initializer. So what does it do? It's going to save off where we are, what we got so far. It's a recursive, this is a recursive algorithm. It's going to, you know, decode the normal parameters. And then if there are children, it will extend the path with um, the current node's name and then reach in and it'll create a nested unkeyed container of its own and recurse just to create all of its own children. And when it's done, it'll update total count because it's an in-out parameter, right? Now the important thing here is that decoders, like I say, they can be passed to arbitrary methods. One trick is they are not valid after their top level decoder finishes. So, at the very, very top, there's gonna to be a decodable that got handed a decoder. You can't put that in a property. I know that because I was like, can we do this? And I went and asked the standard lib folks and they were like, nope, <laughs> you cannot do that. That is not valid um, because it's not guaranteed to be uh, 
uh, valid at the end of decoding. Um, but you are totally free to pass them around and store them. Uh, actually, not as long as you don't store them. I hope you kind of see some of the patterns that are repeating here uh, that come up, I think, for the common, you know, everyday kind of problems. Um, any coding key, I really like. I think it solves a lot of basic problems. Um, and also that you can mix code, any coding key with other coding keys that are convenient. You can uh, use nested containers to drill down. You don't have to make like all these, you don't need to make types you don't care about, except for those top level wrapper types for um, arrays. You sometimes will need it, you know, if, uh, if there's an array. But don't forget about, you know, good old string to something dictionaries, in which case you can sometimes dodge the, uh, the array. Um, Coders and containers are just normal objects. You can pass them around. And extensions, I really want to, I hope what I've really shown is you can make your own extensions on these things and make the code, the, the interface of Codable is not that great. It's kind of clunky. It's very, very clunky. It has a lot of problems. But you can fix it. It's swift. We love to make extensions. But you can do that without losing any flexibility. You can still, it's just swift. It's, there's no magic going on. No trickery. These are great tools. All those were great tools if you have model objects, which is what people do, you know, 90% of the time. But I don't know, what if you just have JSON? I mean, I just want to read the JSON. I don't want to think about model objects. I don't want to decode, I, I just want JSON. What could we do? Now, you may have been doing this before with JSON serialization, stop it. Um, JSON serialization is horrible. It comes from the Objective-C days. Um, it therefore returns you any. JSON objects are not any. Can they be a UI view controller? No, they cannot. They can't be a CV peripheral. They, can, they are not any. They are, in fact, one of a very short list of things they are allowed to be. They can be an object, an array, a number, string, true, false, or null. Interestingly, they're not Booleans. They are true or false. But we can say they're, they're Booleans. That means that a raw JSON decoder should return an enum. Something like this one, right? Before I talk, though, about how to use this type, I want to point out a couple of little quirks about this type. First, numbers store digits as a string. Why? Because JSON defines numbers as a sequence of decimal digits, plus possibly a sign, decimal point, base 10 exponent. But it's, at the end of the day, it's a sequence of digits of arbitrary length and precision, right? Nothing in JSON limits numbers to the range or values of doubles, right? And JSON numbers are absolutely in base 10. They are not in base 2, right? So double is flat out wrong. Um, there is no numeric type in standard lib that can really fully express every legal JSON number. Um, decimal is pretty close, but it's, has limit, it has finite range and therefore can't get everything. But double's just right out, right? I mean, double has binary rounding, which can actually be a real mess in JSON. So I, I highly recommend using decimal for the most part. But at the very bottom, bottom, bottom level, you'd rather use strings so that you don't lose the information. Now, um, standard lib handles decimal really well, uh, or if you decode, encode, and decode decimal, they will keep it in decimal through the whole series in and out, and so you won't have any rounding problems, which is nice. Um, but say you had a big int type, right, that could handle, the, you know, arbitrarily long integers. There is no way using standard lib to encode those as numbers. I'm sorry. Um, you'd have to write your own JSON parser or uh, formatter, which is not as hard as it sounds, but you can't use standard lib. This one's even more interesting. Okay, why, okay. Objects have key value, JSON key values. What's a JSON key value? It is an array of key values. Um, well, okay, but why not dictionary? JSON defines objects as a a uh, set, uh, set of curly brackets surrounding zero or more name value pairs. You know, a dictionary, right? No, 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 no. 
The JSON syntax does not impose any restrictions on the strings used as names, does not require that names be unique, and does not assign any significance to the ordering of name value pairs. These are all semantic considerations that may be defined by JSON processors. Don't misunderstand that assigns no significance. That doesn't mean they're unordered. It means JSON doesn't say. They may be ordered or unordered. That's up to the processor, right? So that means that ordered keys with duplicates is totally legal JSON. So every time somebody on Stack Overflow asks, how do I keep my keys in order? And everybody tells them that's illegal JSON. No, it's not. Standard lib is wrong. And unfortunately, there's no way to work around this in standard lib. Standard lib uses di dictionaries internally and therefore will break you. Sorry, you have to write your own parser. Again, not that hard. Anyway, once we have this JSON uh, value type, encoding is pretty simple. For each type, create a container, encode the thing. Uh, for simple types, that's a single value container, which um, just is a thing that holds one thing. Uh, you don't usually run into this, but it is useful for exactly this purpose. And then for array objects, encode all the key values. For arrays, encode all the values. And for nulls, you, you call this thing called encode nil, which is null in JSON. That's it. OK, now let's take that. We have JSON value. Let's go, go crazy, write about 100 lines of code, and um, make it expressible by just about everything. What could you do with that? You could do beautiful things. You can make JSON in code. And I think this is actually quite beautiful. This is so much better than string any. This is so much better. This is type safe JSON. And you can just use JSON literals. And by the way, expressible by, by dictionary literal maintains order and allows duplicates. So you actually can create full JSON uh, all the way. And with just a little bit extra thing, um, a little extension, you can even put arbitrarily long uh, integers into this. Um, you, as, you have to put them in as strings, but um, I love Swift. <laughs> I love that you can do this, and I hate that people don't do this. Decoding is just a little bit more complicated, but again, not bad, and it is an excellent example of how to handle OR types, where it's like, maybe it's a string, maybe it's an integer. I don't know, because server people hate me. I have a sequence of small functions that I'll try to decode something. I'll show those in just a second. Um, if they have trouble, they all throw type mismatch. If, they, if this is not the right type, they throw type mismatch. And then they try the next matcher. Notice, this is not try question mark. That's on purpose. It only captures type mismatch. This means that when there's an error somewhere deep down that's like it's actually corrupted data, corrupted JSON, you get an error that means something. Type try question mark is bad. <laughs> um, the SwiftTube has actually said, we, you know, it's, it's not a good tool. It was added because it was easy to add. Uh, they probably wouldn't add it now. Um, because it throws away all that information. Catch, the, catch it. And that's really all you need. Um, that's it. Uh, here are, like, what I meant by, they're just little tiny functions that say, you know, try to decode it as this, try to decode it as this, you know, do all that. And with about 100, another 100 lines of code, everything here is like, and 100 lines of code, and then do 100 lines of code. You get a lot of functionality. Let's, let's play with a really complicated thing, the Pokedex API. If you ever want to mess around with JSON, use the Pokedex API. It is wildly complicated. Uh, I love it so much. Um, by writing another 100 lines worth of little accessors, we could drill down into data structures without creating any structs. We can just take this, turn it into JSON, and say, I just want to drill down and pull off abilities at index one, ability, ability, right? Turn it into a string value. I love that. And with a try. So if anything goes wrong, it'll throw. I could add some subscripts. Boom. I mean, this is the syntax everybody wants when they create, when they create a string to any dictionary. They think this will work.
into uh, a JSON value. Uh, the JSON value, their JSON value is an internal type. It's very similar to mine, but has slight differences. Everything here is either private or internal, unfortunately. Um, but the whole method is mostly a wrapper around this just parse value. Everything else is just white space handling. And this is kind of just what parse value does. It walks through a document reader, which just has a whole bunch of data and a, and a cursor that it moves around. And it says, oh, is, it a, is this an open qu uh, quotation mark? Then start getting a string. JSON is so easy to parse. It's, a, it's actually one of the most, it's one of the easiest uh, formats I've ever encountered to parse. There's no look backtracking or ambiguity. It's very, very nice. An interesting project, therefore, is to hack this a bit. Maybe I'll copy the entire uh, JSON parser file over, remove all the parts that actually generate values, and turn it into a scanner. The scanner can just find the places in the data where a particular coding path exists, right? I'm just using the same code that JSON parser does. It just doesn't generate any values. So it's super fast and doesn't eat memory. Ooh, what can I do with that? Well, now I can drill down, you know, extract the data from a coding path, and then say, decode that using the regular decoder. Moving up the stack, JSON parser is used by JSON uh, decoder. JSON decoder is the, you know, the one that we all know and love. Um, it's important that JSON decoder is not a decoder. Ah, that's so weird. Um, it is not the thing you get past in your init methods. Um, it creates the thing that you get past. And that thing is called a JSON decoder impl. That's actually the decoder. Um, unfortunately, JSON decoder impl is private, is file private. You'll notice JSON decoder is open. You can subclass it. But you then can't make a JSON decoder impl, so it's kind of useless. Um, Unfortunately, so what you do, you do what I always do, copy the whole file, rename things, and start hacking on it. Um, you notice, actually, let me go back. You'll notice what it did. All it does is it parses into a JSON value, and then it starts hacking on it, because JSON decoder impl uses a JSON value. Well, what if we already have a JSON value? We could just skip all that nonsense and go straight to it. So that's, that's actually really nice. Now, this is not nearly as fast because you're going to parse the whole thing, but it could be super convenient if you need to like hop around different parts of a giant JSON thing and pull out, pull out this and pull out this and pull out this. That's kind of nice. And that you could kind of explore it if, it, if you weren't exactly certain. How can I go beyond that? Things, these are just projects that I'm currently working on and I'll have links and you can see all the crazy experimental sandbox that's terribly documented, undocumented. Um, I'm building an async version, so you can kind of start working on your payloads before they finish downloading. Um, I'm trying to move error handling into the JSON decoder so that, I'm trying to make it so that you can configure the JSON decoder with, con with protocols so that you, so that the default auto conformance for Codable actually works for you. Um, and then if you need specialized handling, you would just implement like individual little methods to handle things with a new, replacing JSON decoder entirely. Kind of watch this space. Um, anyway, these are the kinds of things you can play with. And that's kind of it. Um, I mean, as I said, this talk isn't about this or that specific technique. It's about getting you to write some code. <laughs> and I think, and thinking about your errors, especially your errors. Um, build extensions that work for your problems. You know, any coding key and JSON value are really nice, you know, little things to hack in. And don't be afraid to, if you have a w wacky problem, hack on JSON decoder. It's, it's not that, especially the, the non-Apple version. It, it's actually not that complicated um, to work on directly. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be overwhelmed because it's like thousands of lines. That's because JSON conformant, like the codable conformances, require about a thousand lines of boilerplate. But it's really, really basic stuff. Uh, it's just code. It's just code. Have a great conference.